Hello, everyone. My name is Veronica Carlin, and I am a member of the Orfeo Music Festival team administering today's webinar. I'm pleased to welcome you all to our fourth session in the new Orfeo Music Festival Spring 2022 webinar series devoted to classical music performance. I believe we have a full and exciting program planned for today. I would now like to introduce Clarissa Jackson, a longtime member, a longtime music director of the Orfeo Music Festival, who has led the planning and development of the festival as well as our webinar program today. Larissa will manage our program today and will be available to answer any questions during and after this webinar. So I'll pass it over to you, Larissa. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, let me say a couple of words about the festival. Uh, Orfeo Music Festival is an international classic music event widely known for its artistic excellence. Uh, for the time, uh, from the time of its founding in 2003, the festival's mission is to celebrate and promote classic uh, uh, music performances and artistic excellence uh, of the highest standard and to offer superior education to the new generation of musicians with the world-class artists to nurture creativity and to build lasting human and artistic bonds. Great, and I just wanted to encourage you all to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we will be posting the webinar series. And of course, you can share that link with anyone who might be interested. Um, so um, we are opening a new webinar series, Music is Our World, which is a three-year initiative by the Orpheum Festival, exploring the role of music in our lives in a variety of different ways, but concentrating on the art of musical performance, which lays at the corner of our musical experience. And today's session is a very exciting uh, piano performance um, and lecture that will feature two of uh, Orfeo artists. Um, and let me first introduce uh, Maria Razumovskaya, who is a um, performing uh, concert pianist um, and is also a member of the you know, faculty uh, at the Gidol School of Music and Drama and uh, described as a virtuoso storyteller uh, of the piano. Uh, Maria is a Steinway artist and has performed extensively across the United States, United Kingdom and internationally. Uh, her most recent notable appearances include the coveted BBC introducing showcase at the Pitville Pump Rooms for the Cheltenham Festival, the St. John Smith Square, Cadogan Hall, St. Martin in the Fields, um, including many others. Uh, so Maria, uh, over to you. And uh, today we're cover uh, covering a topic of romanticism in music. Thank you very much, Larissa. Thank you very much, Veronica. Um, could I encourage people to Come off, uh, come onto camera if they feel like coming onto camera. And I don't want to lecture necessarily. I would love this to be a conversation. So, uh, if people would like to uh, actually ask or answer uh, ideas, uh, just come off mute. So don't don't sort of feel that you you can't do that. I, I think it's much nicer to have a conversation rather than to have just somebody pushing information up at you. So. Um, it's also wonderful to see so many people from different time zones. So I'm aware that some people it's bedtime, some people it's getting to bedtime and some people are uh, trying not to fall asleep. So thank you very much for doing that and, and coming together. Today we're looking at probably one of my favorite composers and probably one of the most important composers for pianists and it's Frederick Chopin. And I mean, in many ways, I would uh, love to say that Chopin is the gateway into romanticism. And I'm, I'm sure if we had uh, other colleagues around, they'd say, no, it's, it's Beethoven or Schubert. Uh, but in, in many ways for me, he is the gateway for romanticism. And I'm going to start by showing you a portrait uh, of Chopin. So uh, this portrait here of Chopin is by a French artist. 
And it's the one you all recognize, right? Yes? Is this the famous portrait of Chopin, which uh, everybody knows? <laughs> Is anybody surprised by that one? I mean, you're all on mute, so I actually can't hear if you're nodding. I can't see you all at the same time either. So if anybody wants to say anything, otherwise I will keep talking. But if anybody has any comments, then no. Um, this portrait. Not de la Croix. Well, the one that I was associated with Chopin would have been this one here. This mm -hmm. one for me is far more familiar as, as, as the Chopin portrait. But there are so many other portraits that look so familiar and similar to the first. This one is very unusual by Delacroix. Um, the other portraits are much, much more similar to that first one I showed you. So this is another portrait. They're all around the same date. Uh, these are all painted within a couple of years of each other. So here's another portrait of Chopin. And I, I don't know if you recognize this as your Chopin when you look at it. Um, this, this comes to my question, because if we have a look at this very first portrait, just one more time, what we're really looking at uh, with this first portrait is, is a particular kind of outlook on art, which values particular things. So I was wondering if somebody would be brave to come off mute and describe what this portrait might be trying to evoke for you. I mean, this is a very talented artist of his time. Um, Gayot, he, wrote, he, he composed this portrait just before 1840. So Chopin still has a good nine years of his life ahead of him. I mean, compared to the Delacroix serenity, you've got, I mean, if you just look at what you're looking at here, you've got a landscape behind Chopin. It's not raining. There is no storm on the horizon. It's, it's a pretty friendly landscape, isn't it? He's also sheltered from that landscape by a column. He's holding in his hand something as well probably a manuscript, but everything about this is comfortable. There's something quite warm about it. Would you say it's some sort of Mediterranean feel to there? Perhaps you're all on mute, so I, I don't know if you're agreeing or dis <laughs> disagreeing. Um, I'm gonna show you another portrait. This one's not of Chopin. The next portrait that I'm going to show you is by Gainsborough. And see what you make of this compared to that Chopin portrait. So this is very typical 18th century painting portraits. There's a lot of similarities between those poses. There's a lot of similarities between what is happening with where the subject is, where the person is. The idea of uh, a landscape far in the distance. And also, you'll see a very strong vertical line behind Mrs. Thomas as well. Again, that same vertical line. So what's going on here? What is this 18th century ideal that is very important as Chopin actually starts to become a celebrated artist? What is this common language of culture uh, that starts off and, and, and ignites this romantic movement? Well, I would say that the idea that nature there is in the background, it's a sort of tame nature. I mean, it's a garden. And that distance between nature and subject, there is something man-made there. There is something that is uh, showing man's ability to cultivate and ability to create that distance, that command and that control. If we look at the Delacroix, it's a completely different sense that we're getting. We lack vertical lines, right? There are no vertical lines in this painting. We also have very different uh, color palettes in many ways uh, because it's not aiming to produce the sense of stability. There is a sense that where the subject ends, where the rest of the painting begins, that line becomes far more blurred. And if we look at the idea of romantic painting through someone like Caspar David Friedrich, who really is the iconic romantic uh, painter, 
you can see there's a big change. This is not Mrs. Thomas standing with the column behind her and nature being very friendly, this idea of tame nature behind. Um, he's got his back to you. He's not really interested what you think. He's actually far more interested to make you think how insignificant we all are compared to this landscape. Uh, I know you're very reluctant to come off mute, but uh, does anybody here feel particularly safe or at ease looking at this landscape here? I think everybody's being far too polite to stay on mute. That's fine. <laughs> um, there's a sense that something is changing in the atmosphere and it's changing very quickly. Here's another painting by Caspar David Friedrich using more of the color scheme of that Delacroix portrait. And when I mention straight lines, I mean, I would challenge you to find any straight lines in this painting whatsoever. Uh, the sense of having a line that is unstable becomes very important. A, a, a line that doesn't want to separate a painting symmetrically either. The lines of symmetry here are deliberately skewed. So you get the sense of unstableness. There is something there that is beyond your control. You almost want to reach out and stop things falling apart there. You're also looking at a very different narrative. There's a very little tameness about this. There's everything here signifies your insignificance around this landscape for a start. Secondly, also significant signify some kind of belatedness here. You have not wandered into a landscape which is new and young and optimistic. You're too late to stop this scene happening. There is something here that should hit you there. Whatever you've done, and somehow you've done this because you're looking at it, somehow this, this is part of what you have done to the world. You're too late to stop it happening. And this is something that gets very clearly reflected in how Chopin's life is narrated. So Chopin, uh, when he was young and when those uh, portraits, these very, very classical portraits of him uh, were being famously seen by people. I mean, most people would have seen the Chopin portraits looking like this um, in his time. They would have actually said that he was one of the most classical men of his age. Uh, he came into a sense of such perfect symmetry that Schumann famously exclaimed, hats off gentleman, a genius. Schumann was so impressed that somebody could have such secure command of symmetry and stability and this radiance and this sunshine um, that he was very proud to use, his, uh, to use his newspaper to declare him one of the greatest geniuses of the age. And so writing about a 15-year-old Chopin, uh, after hearing something like this, Schumann says, hats off. to those passages endlessly. They're not flowing anywhere to any disaster. They're full of sunshine, full of radiance. And this is the kind of music that Chopin was known for. Uh, this is the kind of music that really made Chopin famous. Uh, but then something happens in Chopin's style. And immediately, almost, uh, Schumann relinquishes his hats off, a genius. And what happens with that style uh, is something that Liszt picks up. He, um, he only dares to write this after Chopin dies, but he writes something quite provocative. He says, um, I mean, let's, let's think, of, I'll put the Delacroix portrait up whilst I, I read you a bit of this Liszt quote about Chopin. So if you look at this portrait and then consider Liszt's idea, uh, Chopin, his works swirl with the passionate rancor of a man suffering from wounds far more serious than he's prepared to acknowledge. 
just as shattered beams and spars swirl around the sinking ship. He had such acute sufferings and they devoured him like claw marks of a bird of prey on a beautiful body. This is where your Delacroix portrait is coming from. This sense of struggle, this sense of um, some kind of uh, suffering that's far too great to bear and is going to find an artistic output. And what Liszt was trying to persuade people of his age was to understand that Chopin can't be seen anymore in those classical frameworks. Chopin's done something to shift outside of them. I mean, Liszt had to actually write a whole book on Chopin to try and persuade people that Chopin was not a classical artist. For us, it goes as a given. For, for Liszt, he felt he had to write a whole book. And the big change that Liszt said happened between classicism and romanticism uh, was that well, the classics were trying very hard to make things make sense. Um, the idea of the Enlightenment was to reason and come to some kind of understanding that, that could be shared with the, with the community. The Romantics deliberately turned their back on that. They, they called themselves Romantics to, to establish a separation from the Enlightenment. And Liszt goes even further. Uh, he takes Chopin and he says, Chopin had to not be an enlightened figure because he was a Slav. And as a Slav, it is easy to misjudge their intentions and characters. Their loyalty and frankness, familiarity and captivating sense and ease of manner do not and should not imply openness or confidence. Their feelings are kept half hidden, half hidden, half revealed, like the coils of an entwined serpent. And it is naive to take at face value their outward humility. So quite a statement from, from Liszt, but taken with this uh, painting that we had a look at by Caspar David Friedrich, that sense of you can't really know what you're looking at. It's half hidden, half revealed. That is what the age of romanticism is trying very hard uh, to project. And it's trying consciously to project that. So it's not happening as a kind of um, um, offshoot of, of classical thought or enlightened thought. These are people who are trying deliberately to create a break from a previous way of thinking. So one of the pieces that Schumann said was uh, symptomatic of Chopin turning his back on any sense of this classical symmetry was his first ballad, which is why we're going to be looking at it today in connection with this idea of romanticism. Chopin's first ballad uh, was written in 1828, and it's written at a time when there is a very strong sense still uh, of what a piece of music is going to be sounding like. There's a very strong uh, sense that when you've got a piece of music, uh, you've got to have um, structures within it that speak of certain uh, characteristics. And one of the easiest characteristics to latch onto is uh, for the time is, is the dance genre, partly because everybody at the time knows the basic steps to dances. And this ballad, although it's written uh, in, in several time signatures all the way through, the one that stays around the most is 6-4. Six 6-4 four. Uh, six four is wonderful for Chopin because it separates both into three and two. So if you think about the sense of not having stability, if you think of that sense of that what Liszt called that coiled serpent with uh, its feelings half hidden and half revealed, that provides that perfect instability. You can be both in three in the waltz or you cannot be in that waltz. The genre of the waltz would have immediate connotations for people. Uh, and I'm going to share one of the uh, waltzes that I think is the most uplifting that I've heard, certainly for, for a long time. This, this is something fantastic. Um, I say uplifting just because if you purely take it out of the story, there's there's something so wonderful about the flow of it.
very, very tiny extract of the Berlioz Waltz. I don't know how you cannot want to swing to that music. It's, it's just so, for me, just totally uplifting um, to listen to. I know you don't want to come off your mute, but does anybody want to say why it's so significant, this waltz, uh, in terms of the actual story itself, or, or Berlioz or something fantastic? No, everybody's going to definitely stay it's on. It's at the ball that, that he meets the girl that he falls in love with. Yes, and then what happens? He kills her in the end, doesn't he? There you go. <laughs> so it, it's not, that's why I say it. it's, it's lovely, it's optimistic, but then it's not very optimistic. Uh, so yes, so Berlioz is um, at this moment at a ball. And it, I mean, we, we're still in love with the idea of balls now, even, you know, without going through the dancing and the rituals that they would have been part of their daily lives in the 18th and 19th century. Um, the, the idea of a ball being a transformation, a coming of age, and a, a beginning of positive things to come. You'd, you'd meet and uh, people who would transform your life to something better at this ball. And what Berlioz does is probably one of the first composers to do this to the waltz. He puts it into the context of falling in love with the actress Harriet Smith, uh, which is uh, autobiographically the correct bit of, of what happened in his own life. What didn't happen was that he didn't actually murder Harriet Smith, which he does in the Symphonie Fantastique. Um, so uh, reality and art here should stay well separated out. Uh, in the Symphonie Fantastique, that waltz then takes on that really strange character of going through other genres. And we keep hearing that swirls of that waltz turn into other things. Um, it, there's a moment where it turns into the march to the scaffold, where as a murderer, Berlioz gets his head cut off. Um, and then the witch's Sabbath at the end, we'll, we'll talk about the significance of that slightly later, but the, the sense that there's other dances that are more grotesque that come out of this beautiful transformative waltz. So Chopin actually heard this music and he said that it was probably one of the biggest shifts in his understanding of culture. Uh, he said more so than any Italian operas, and we always think of Chopin and Italian opera, he said more so than any Italian opera, uh, anyone who wants to make a mark on the world needs to know uh, Berlioz's music. So with that in mind, the Chopin first ballade, uh, I'm going to put it on the screen here for you uh, to have a look at the score. We start with the 6-4 section here. I'll go through the first line in a second, but 6-4, so this idea could be 3, could be 2. Even if I didn't tell you it was in 6-4, you would tell me waltz. There's that waltz feeling, and, and the whole of the ballad will have a series of these kinds of waltzes woven into it. That is significant because for his listeners, that waltz is something that is comforting. It's something to latch onto. So each time it comes in different transformations, they have to work out for themselves how far Chopin is playing with that sense of stability in that waltz. And usually the waltz comes at a start of a new section. We have very clear. And the whole ballad is marked out of these sections. So for his listeners, he's definitely giving them that sense of, here, hold on to this classical symmetry, this classical sense of stability, this classical sense of hope. The very first moment we hear that waltz, we desperately need that hope because the very, very start of the piece uh, has nothing to do uh, with stability in any shape or form. Oh, sorry, I'm going to change the, I was going to change the coming around. Um, we start on a C octave. And silence. We can see from the title that we're in G minor. C is, is very, very far away. Thank you. 
that section there, if you think of those paintings that I showed at the beginning, that must be the epitome of something that's unstable, something that's skewed, something that doesn't settle. You can hear over here, there's a silence underneath that note and you want to know what next. And you, you've just, you're witnessing, like those two men with the moon in the background and those, those strange gnarled trees, you've, you've come and no one is telling you what's going on. You're just faced with this mess, whatever it is. You're nowhere near G minor. All you've heard is this strange statement. It's not symmetrical because it's made up of groups. If we look here, one, two, three bars, two bars, three bars, two bars. It's not this four plus four symmetry that people of, the, of Chopin's time are so accustomed to, so attuned to. Um, if we think of Chopin's nocturnes, the early ones, or the early waltzes, that four plus four bar structure is pretty much what guarantees them their classic FM status, as always in the top uh, 20 works or so for the relaxing classics tunes. That there's something nice about hearing four and four bars um, that gives us that sense of a musical hug in, this, in essence. Here we've had three bars, gap, two bars, even bigger gap, and then a lonely note. And now you're all desperate to hear how it's going to resolve. Um, he resolves it in G minor, but he moves on straight away from it. So you, you get already the sense of... have a look at the groups that he's got. Uh, they all have a very strong C. Uh, I don't know if you can see the annotation very well on your screens, but I, I could let you play a game and sort of chase all the C's around here. Um, you'd find lots and lots of C's in this score. Um, if you know your music theory even a little bit, G minor, uh, is, is actually a key which should be playing a lot of G, B flat, D. Should have lots of G. There's no C in the chord of G minor. So we've got a note that doesn't belong in that tonic. The other chord relationship to G is D, the, the dominant, the, the leading chord. D, F sharp and A doesn't have a C in it either. So seeing that C all the time is, is very, very far away. That already asks these questions. What is that C doing? We start the whole piece on a C. It's a wonderful chord. You could almost hear someone like Debussy opening a piece with that. It starts to sound like, like fog. A piece should normally start in its home key, so G minor, or in the dominant, to then go to G. So you'd normally have something should go. And that gives you a satisfying, oh, okay, the music is getting started. There's also another way of trying to prolong that. And that is by adding this strange chord here that Chopin uses. what you were hearing in the beginning. That chord there is called a Neapolitan chord. And what it does, it only has one function. It's, it's only function, only reason to be invented is to try and prolong the inevitable. Just to try and get more and more time to exist. So why are we starting a piece with a chord that's deliberately telling us that this is gonna take a long time. We're starting far away, but also we know that it can only go one direction. So Chopin plays around with this sense of instability. He starts by saying, this is not just a big piece. This is a piece that's gonna take you by surprise. 
So what I'm going to do is actually show you uh, the first two pages but it takes a long time for us to feel like we're anywhere near the home key G minor. We'll only start to feel settled, we'll only start to lose that C by the time we get to this bit here. It's a long time, it's a page and a half to wait for the music to settle down. Uh, just came up. just got to we start another waltz so you've got a very strong sense of the audience being told right here's your symmetry here's your next waltz and that's the first point you've actually felt that's the first point you felt grounded in G minor now I say that's the first point we've actually heard a G minor six times before then, but we haven't felt settled in it. I mean, I, I wonder if anybody else would uh, be able to pinpoint a bit that they thought, yes, that was definitely G minor before that point. Did the music feel it settled at any point before then to anyone? There was, there's a small turning point just before. So just, just where you, you it changes, changes page. Sorry, I wasn't able to change the page as I was playing. Um, it went. music has got there. That was here. Problem is that's C minor, that's not G minor. So the moment it felt settled there was C minor. Uh, totally in the wrong place, much closer to your opening there. The other time it almost settled was just around that trill, would you, would you say? You could almost feel that the music is going to find its direction. That's again, it's the wrong place. It's treating G minor as the leading into C minor. Then there was one other time. And then you have this wonderful cascade. I mean, that, that moment there alone is just like a light coming on in the room, isn't it? You've got this dark color. Happening at that point, that, that sense of, and then 
it, it's such a beautiful radiant moment that he, he just has this big flourish. <laughs> How could you not feel like somebody's you know trying to tell you that everything's gonna be alright there? It's just the sudden flourish that then eventually settles into that G minor. And we know that this moment was very significant for um, Chopin because when you look at his manuscript, uh, which I can actually show you, uh, where is it? His manuscript, you can see that he spent a lot of time over that passage. It was it didn't come easily to him. Uh, it's a very clean first page. Here is this flourish that I was talking about here. There it is. All scribbled up and reworked. Uh, there was something about it that was bothering him. There, there was something about that flourish. And I'll come back to another bit in the score where he's not satisfied. Um, so th there's obviously something going on there. And, and perhaps there is something that we should also be aware of what's going on here. Um, that beautiful section there, this is G minor. We were here. You can already hear it's worlds apart. The opening, what kind of A's did we have? A flats. The piece is desperate to avoid A flats because A flat signifies that we're in that chord of the beginning, the one that's going to tell us it's a long, painful journey. And A natural is part of the dominant chord. So A natural is part of the. We've nearly solved it. The A flat tells us it's going to take a long time. So this is the first time that we get a very strong sense of we've broken free from the spell of A flat. And we get exactly that same thing symmetrically right at the end of the piece, which I'll come to in just a second. Um, the series of waltzes I was mentioning uh, continues. And we get sw swirling sections and calm sections here again. This bit before Menomoso, we settle in a key that has fanfare. That fanfare is an F major. F major doesn't have any A flat, so we can sense a stability there. And even though we're going to get some A flats in that next section, then they don't feel threatening. We forget that threat. Uh, we actually walk into them with quite a lot of naivety. We don't, we don't remember that opening chord and that danger that it signals, that instability that it tells us. Because he's told us that we're safe, he's holding our hand. Fifths are always comforting. which we find so beautiful, so interesting, so alluring, that we, we forget, actually, by listening to it, that what we should be feeling is very afraid. And even Chopin forgets um, that we should be afraid. So we get a, a sense far too late. We get the sense on this page here where the A flat comes back. <laughs> suddenly hear a chill. And Chopin puts that directly to us after a beautiful long section. We hear, we hear an A flat, we then hear a diminuendo, we're scared a little bit, but we're still pushing forward. And it's only here, this rallentando that takes us to this inevitable. We've listened to that A flat, that A flat takes us back to this danger zone. So this is the section where you should be scared but you forget to be scared so this idea of you walked into this landscape you don't know what you've done
didn't have a score to follow, you'd uh, be able to straight away say that at, that at that point in the music, what you're feeling is some kind of cold chill running down uh, the back of your neck. You've suddenly realized too late with the theme again coming back, reminding you that all is not well. That waltz now starts to become more grotesque, more unwelcome than it was in the beginning. In the beginning, maybe melancholic, but here there is something etching into it that's quite disturbing. And we can see that Chopin is, is psychologically trying to tell you that don't worry, don't worry, uh, we'll be absolutely fine here because he arrives with this waltz theme, not in G minor, but in A minor. And you might think, okay, well, you just said that A naturals are the place to go uh, because A naturals are far away from that chord. Um, so A, A natural, A minor. Well, A minors have G sharps and G sharps, think of those coils of your serpent intertwined while the G sharp is in A flat. So actually you haven't gone anywhere from that. It's just hidden. The threat is now not in full sight. So thinking of what Liszt was writing about Romanticism and Chopin uh, as, as something half hidden, half revealed, you can see Chopin himself is really playing around with that sense and that material. Um, he knows that his reader also is going to be very, uh, his um, reader and uh, musician is going to be very aware that tension A, yes, we've been uh, trying to get to A, A should be the sense of liberation, but we've also got that G sharp, so A, A minor, not quite far enough away. But what happens though is into the next waltz, there is this beautiful sense of release and you'll feel it straight away as, as soon as you, I mean, you've just had this chilling moment, but you start to hear this release. That's your G sharp or your A flat previously. that G sharp, oh, sorry, I forgot to change the camera. Uh, he's, he's really trying to try to push through it. He did it, he's out. That's an A. Finally, you feel, okay, great. He's escaped that G sharp, that A flat, there it is. one of the most uh, uplifting moments in that piece up up, up to that point. Uh, you, you get a sense that suddenly after that knocking on the door, that way out to A major, the sun is finally coming out. It's turning the tide in this ballad. In terms of the structure, you're pretty much halfway. So actually from this bit onwards, it should all just be plain sailing into some kind of amazing place of security and, and stability. Uh, but of course it's Chopin and it's not to be. Uh, you get a, a big outpouring of joy eventually. All the kind of glittering of the ball. Um, and it doesn't, doesn't last, but it does end in this very triumphant section, uh, a bit lower down. You'll hear the, the waltz theme from before. Uh, come back from this one, the one that I played, uh, this one. That sense of comfort comes back, but it comes back in a different register with a lots of busy left hand there, fortissimo. And, and this is the section, which if you look at Chopin's manuscript, really gave him a lot of trouble. And, and I mean, a lot of trouble, uh, let me just quickly show you how much scribbling it took him to get this section right. He's a very neat composer. He writes out almost, almost in fair copy straight away. You can see hardly anything gets corrected here. It's all, all plain sailing. And here comes this section that I'm going to uh, show you. Look at the amount of reworking that it takes. Compared to those fair copies before, you've got quite a lot of, of struggle going on here. And, What's, what's significant here with all of this blotting out, changing his mind almost every beat about the chords, is going to be that struggle between the A 
and the A flat. The two are going to be struggling side by side. So I'm going to play you this section from the forte with all this scribbling. And I'll just quickly show you through how he creates that sense of instability for us. Um, so, so we've ended up with something really quite beautiful and, and radiant. <laughs> through the A flat. So this is here, still lots of A flat. Now we're reminded that we shouldn't be anywhere near those A flats. There's notes of premonition here that he introduces. Do we listen to these? No, because we're so taken by all that sweeping. We pay no attention, we're far too taken. And then we get the same thing we heard before, exactly the same idea. And we should have learned from our past mistakes that that can't be good. And this is these A flats that Chopin originally notated in a different key. And it took him a long time to find the confidence to work that A flat back into such a radiant passage. It's all too late. And we're back to where we started. So in this case, our A flats have found the A natural, but that A natural just taken us. There's a sense of a loop that feels like looking at that painting of Caspar David Friedrich. We've come and we're staring again at that landscape. We, we know that it's suffering in there somehow. We know we've had a whole piece almost up until this point to try and sort it out. And yet we've done absolutely nothing about it. And that is the last waltz we hear in the ballad. Uh, next, what we hear is the famous uh, coda. So he starts to try and break free with this coda. Oops. So the coda appears. <laughs> and it's not a waltz. It's another dance that the audience of Chopin's time would have been very, very well able to recognize. And that dance is the Tarantella. And the Tarantella, uh, in terms of the romantic tradition, was always the dance of despair, destruction, basically of the end. So this is a, a, a bit from the ballet uh, Giselle, Giselle was written in France roughly around about the same time as Chopin and all his uh, friends and artists were uh, trying to define this idea of romanticism. And they, they still knew that their audience would know that Tarantellas were all about doom and gloom. So this, these are the spirits who have uh, suffered uh, at the hands of an unrequited love or committed suicide. Um, and what they do is they basically make men dance to death. And this is all, the, all of their dancers are waltzes, apart from when they dance people to death, 
Neil Tarantellas. Sorry, I've got the wrong clip up. Very sorry. I need to just stop the share screen and reshare. Just put a clip. So Chopin's audience would have well recognized this Tarantella theme. And the way that Chopin's Tarantella also uh, cascades to its end is through a scale. Sorry. Oh, I found the clip. Apologies. Here's the Tarantella loading then. Here you've got a very triumphant ending there that this is exactly what serves him right uh, for acting like he did and dying from dancing. In, in Chopin, the Tarantella ends, uh, as I said, tragically. And you get the funeral march rhythm at the end. That's a complete chaotic cascade that doesn't fit into any kind of harmony. <laughs> It's only at the end we actually get completely, uh, in, in, ter in theoretical terms, established G minor chords with the strong root in their base. So uh, Chopin has been able in this ballad, this is, he's writing this, he's only 17 years old when he's writing this. Um, he's, he's capturing a change of thinking that goes from, uh, what, when, when, Liszt, when Liszt was writing, he didn't need to explain that Chopin might have some kind of classical structures within him. That would have been, as that portrait shows, really far too obvious. Um, the idea that, that Gainsborough shows, uh, which is very typical of classicism, this idea that there is a sense of um, symmetry, tameness, of being in control of the situation. That language is completely stripped away and, and eroded. And this is the deliberate turning into romanticism. Nothing is under control. 
how can something be under control? There is nothing that can be controlled. Um, and and th this sense that there is always instability, it's taken through the structures, it's taken through showing you um, with, with this beautiful uh, harmony uh, that actually you, you, you feel relaxed and, and amazed at how wonderful something feels. And you forget that actually what you're looking at is something that should be scaring you, that sense of being late to save the moment, that, that sense of, I couldn't do anything about it. It was inevitable. It was beyond my power. Leaves you actually feeling uh, really helpless. So, but Larissa, I have completely misjudged my time and I'm running quickly out of time. Do we have time for me to put the ballad in full or? Yes, please go on. Yes, thank you. Uh, so rather than risk my Zoom connection, I'm afraid I'm going to put a recording on um, of the ballad instead. Uh, because my Zoom isn't going to hold out otherwise. Um, so this is, hopefully, if you start thinking these ideas of instability, uh, of, of some kind of use of the ideas of classicism to, to give you a sense of structure, to give you a sense of something to latch onto, and yet it being just taken away um, right from underneath you, and you realizing too late that that has been done. And so this is 17 year old Chopin trying to put all that together.
So thank you very much. Um, I think my colleagues are going to be now speaking more about uh, Chopin. Uh, I guess we don't have time for questions, but if there were any questions, I'm very happy to. Thank you, Maria. Thank, thank you. you. Um, we will have time for everything. So, uh, but uh, let, let us um, um, now welcome Matteo. Um, Matteo Cardelli, a pianist, a young pianist, um, who, um, who was awarded um, with the special prize Donato de Rosa for the best performance of a sonata by Ludwig van Beethoven at the Antonio Casagrande the International Piano Competition, and was a finalist at Ferruccio Busoni International Piano Competition. Um, Matteo uh, performs both as soloist and in chamber music groups in prestigious venues in Italy, Europe, USA, Asia, including New York, Hong Kong, Switzerland. In September 2020, he played the entire cycle of Beethoven cello sonatas in Basel with his brother Giacomo Cardelli. And in June 2019, he gave his debut in Basel Music Theater playing the Brahms Second Piano Concerto uh, with the Symphony Orchestra Basel. So we'd like to welcome Matteo today. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Larissa, for uh, the fantastic introduction and uh, for inviting me to take part in this. A fantastic webinar series. It's a honor and privilege to be here. So, and thank you also for a beautiful lecture on the Chopin ballad. Oh, uh, Quick, otherwise it's a mad choice, a Yes. It'd be great to understand the music. Yeah. Hello. It'd be great. Great. I'm understand. sorry to intervene. I think somebody has a microphone oh. on. Please check your microphones. To understand the music. Hello. Hello. To gain, uh, yeah, that's fine. Microphones, microphones, please check your microphones. Matteo and Maria. Um, so we can we can continue discussion of um, Chopin. Uh, would you like to start with your performance, Matteo, first? Uh, you were going to play piano um, preludes. Or? Yes, with pleasure, yes. I'm right here in, in Basel Music Academy, where I also work as the assistant teacher for my uh, former maestro Filippo Gamba and uh, yes I, I will uh, I will play for you uh, hopefully with a good mic and a good uh, <laughs> quality of sound for you all uh, a selection of from the 24 preludes opus 28 by Frédéric Chopin so uh, if you are all hearing me well I can start and, uh, and then we can talk about Chopin after that. Thank you. 
Bravo, bravo. Thank you so much for a fantastic Chopin. Save some of the beloved preludes. Um, well, Maria, uh, please join us, uh, Matteo. Let's talk about um, what is romantic in Chopin's preludes. Are preludes uh, displaying any classical elements as Maria discussed, brought up earlier? Um, we can also well, compare to the ballad. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, well, starting from uh, what's obvious, um, of course, Chopin knew very well uh, the Hummel preludes, uh, which were written a few years before. But what is, um, I find, quite uh, different uh, between Chopin idea, um, what he tried to do with these preludes was to go beyond uh, the uh, introductory piece and uh, the kind of the style exercise. So what was, for example, in Hummel, um, if we go even back, of course, with the Bach preludes and fugue, that they were also introductory pieces. So always accompanied to a fugue. In this case, we have just uh, small miniatures, uh, a little bit uh, like we have, for example, in the Etudes as well by Chopin. So we have this, um, let's say, we dive deeply into a very small world. So th there's a lot to say in these very small and concentrated pieces, which can all stand on their own. So they have their own, uh, uh, they are finished, uh, each and every one of them. And so, of course, comparing to the ballad, also, um, also, the ancient ballad was a totally different piece. So what Chopin did uh, by writing four of these uh, huge forms was, again, elevating and making this independent as a, as a piece, as a form, as an idea, uh, and, and uh, create something uh, completely new out of it. So it's, uh, I find it's, uh, it can be called classical, in the sense that these forms are not new. So he took something which was there and was already used before him, but the, he is deeply romantic in the use he did of this form. And in particular for the preludes, uh, I find uh, that this is going already in the direction which also Schumann cultivated a lot. So uh, after, also the huge experience with Beethoven symphonies and sonatas were the king of the musical form. And after that, there was a little bit of a crisis, let's say, uh, whenever a composer had to uh, deal with this uh, past and with these forms. It was, it was all the time like, I have to measure up to this standard, but uh, finding unity and uh, new uh, beauty, new finished forms, uh, other than these uh, big traditional ones, uh, I think it was a, a big important step. And, and, and I, I was talking about Schumann because I find also he tried to create big forms, but starting from these miniature-like ideas. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think this is a good uh, starting point maybe to, to to talk about. Oh, well, it is want... true. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody else was talking, sorry. No. Uh, yeah, I think it's true that prelude is, it, yeah, it can only be compared to etude, I guess, in its kind of standalone function and um, exploring one emotion in depth, even, um, even for a short time. Um, but um, preludes, 
with Chopin became yes standalone masterpieces, those small and but the idea definitely is very romantic. Take uh, something um, from like unsubstantial, just a prelude, right? What it's 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 not even a main core main course so to speak, and make it uh, the main course. Um, in the prelude, it's very interesting how. Um, one idea, pattern, rhythmical pattern is taken in the beginning, which continues until the end, which is also similar to etude, but in the etude, it's, it's more of a technical issue, display issue. And in prelude, um, there is no kind of burden of technical display, just, just the catching the sense and exploring that. There is never a contrasting section, right? In prelude or some other melody. It's just the way it starts, that's the way it goes and ends in one mode. Uh, sorry, Maria, please. No, I was just going to pick up on the idea of Schumann, but also the idea of, uh, when I said Chopin, for me is the first romantic. Uh, for me, writing those credits is one of those throwing the gloves into the arena moments for Chopin because I mean, we, we have this cliche that preludes are tiny and insubstantial. Actually, preludes were huge. Um, preludes and overtures in Baroque music, they can take up most of the suite in terms of a proportion. So it's, it's a very strange mindset that we have that preludes are really tiny little sort of suites um, before the main course. Um, e even when, uh, when, when someone like Mozart is writing his C minor sonata, there's a whole fantasy, which is in itself a spin-off from, from a prelude. C.P. Bach has preludes which are much longer than his concertos or his sonatas. So uh, audiences would have been understanding of prelude in a different way as a preparation. And that's why they could have been very long because it was almost like today we have these program notes or we have uh, illustrated talks. Uh, people didn't have that. They didn't talk about music in that way. What they would do is they would play with the themes around. They would prepare you spiritually to now hear the piece of music. And that was the function of the prelude, to take you from one piece of music um, in, into another, or to actually just hear as a really uh, pioneering work, here's a prelude to go with it. But the anticipation there is the prelude is a preparation for something. So it gets answered. Um, what Chopin does is he removes the answers. I think that is the, the really significant thing. So when we say they stand alone, yes, they're questions that have no answer. So again, thinking back to those, those paintings, we're standing there, we see things that we have lots of questions about, but no one is going to give us any answers. What are they looking at? What do they see? Why are they scared? Or what do they want to change? How do they feel? We don't know. And, and that is this romantic mindset, this idea that we don't know. The Enlightenment, the classics, uh, the classicists were very much about rationalizing and finding answers. So a prelude had to have something that follows. Not necessarily, I mean, fugue is the most obvious, but you also get preludes following, uh, other pieces following preludes. Chopin's prelude finishes. <laughs> you know, we can hear all of them and it's lots, we have 15 questions with no answers and we can hear them all together or we can hear them individually. It doesn't matter. We won't be any wiser whether we hear them individually. And I think that is when Debussy picks up the idea of predator, he wouldn't have been able to do this without Chopin. He, he puts the titles at the end. You see, there's this sense that you don't know. You put the title at the end because his audience needs an answer. Uh, try this one. It's, it's, it's like a crossword. It's, it's right at the end. Rachmaninoff does the same thing, I think, when he writes his predators. He's, he's searching for something that he never finds. Um, and, and I think that's why the process of writing them was, was so dramatic. So um, I, I, for me, again, I, I think Chopin is the first romantic in that he's redefining what romanticism is by just tearing up that rule book. And uh, like you say, he's using classical language so that you, he can then create that distance away from it. Um, I think Matthias, when he was, you know, in each individual one trying to show that we, we can have another one or maybe not, or maybe yes. Or maybe, so I was watching and you like, are you going to turn the page or not? Because in a way I, I, that question never really got resolved. And I think that's exactly what Chopin would have wanted his audience to feel. Um, Schumann yes, never it. actually wrote a prelude that had no answer. He, he had Sphinx as the riddle in the carnival, but all his preambulums, all his preludes, they all get answered. Um, even his riddle of the Sphinx gets answered because it's written out underneath. <laughs> he couldn't he couldn't leave a question unanswered. So I, th I think there Chopin did take the upper hand. 
Yeah, I find it uh, very true and uh, very interesting also. Yeah, of course, um, there were also huge forms, as you said, in Baroque music. So as an introduction to, anyway, uh, something else. And uh, uh, maybe a huge composition after or a series of uh, small pieces, like a suite or something like that. But again, uh, or like an overture for an opera or melodrama. Or, and th that's, that's what we, we are used to think also when we go back uh, to the uh, uncle or grandfather of Chopin's preludes. But of course, as you said, it's very, very, I, I really am on the same page. They are a series of questions. Maybe I just find if we dive into more detail, uh, some of them may be already like a statement more than a question mark, just for the character and the musical content of the piece. Uh, and it's interesting also for me, uh, as I, I tend to analyze a lot uh, in the, the, the score, but also related to in other music, uh, not only from that specific composer, how Chopin treated these tonalities and how we can find them again in other pieces. So for example, just for example, this G minor ballad that you played, again, the G minor play, prelude shares also, there is this kind of uh, uh, color or picture of, uh, of this, of course, it's part of the, of the bigger picture you have in the ballad, but again, it's like he also tried to or he didn't try, he just came, it just came out of, uh, of him uh, naturally. So how he um, interpreted these tonalities and how every tonality gave him a special feeling or, uh, I don't know, it, I find sometimes uh, these uh, particular characteristics also in other composers, uh, in Schubert music also, it, there's a lot of these uh, tonality reminders, uh, even if the, the language is radically different from Chopin, as you said, the very first romantic. So uh, we can find, looking back, some romanticism also in other kind of music, but they didn't know, maybe. <laughs> they were writing in a way we then would, would have thought about as romantic. Um, also, yes, I um, I'm also working right now on Scriabin's preludes, for example, and they share also uh, Scriabin was in love with Chopin music at his young age, so um, they also share this question mark quality, and uh, they are quite close to each other uh, with with Chopin. Uh, each parallel piece uh, can be put just <laughs> one after the other and you will al almost have a continuum between the two. So it's really interesting also how two very different uh, and distant composers in space and time, they, they come to the same questions perhaps, or they ask themselves the same questions, this we don't know. Also, Chopin took uh, a lot of time writing these uh, pieces. There are letters where he is asking for more time or oh, yes, uh, they will come. They, I'm almost finished. I still mm, finishing this one, this one. Yes, uh, I'm almost done. So uh, it was a, surely a dear piece. And again, he never performed after the entire cycle during his lifetime. And this didn't happen either after he was dead. So again, we, maybe nowadays uh, or after this tradition of recording and playing the entire cycle came up, we try to find uh, or to make up an answer by putting them all together, like again, a big composition, a big cycle, like for example, as you said, other Schumann composition, but they were already imagined to be played and performed together. So we try to, because we have this sense of uh, void, of uh, unanswered uh, doubts. And so we maybe with a series of questions, somehow <laughs> we can find ourselves an answer to this 
mystery of a piece. That, that's, uh, that's what I think about also the, let's say, the performance praxis of these preludes, if we can call it that. Do we need answers? Well, I'm curious because I, I think there's a couple of pianists in, in the session. Um, the preludes get played a lot as a cycle, don't they? Uh, I don't think people play all the four ballads in concert with the same amount of sort of zeal. Um, the waltzes for sure nobody plays as a cycle. Um, Matteo, you mentioned that, that, that the Schumann would have been played as a cycle. We um, Yes and no in many ways. Actually, we know that Clara Schumann played um, Chris Liriana with Frau Lieben und Leben halfway through it. So <laughs> I don't think that, that they were even expecting those pieces to be played as a cycle. So very much a modern idea, like like you say, to do. To, to, but I, I wonder why the Chopin we play as a cycle, whereas the Scrabin very rarely we play the preludes as a cycle, we mix and match them. But I was just curious whether any of the pianists here or Matteo has any ideas about that. Can I suggest something? Uh, Chopin was a teenager when he wrote the um, ballad. And what I think you have to take into account is the hormones and the, the physiology of being a teenager. You don't know all the answers. You have a lot of questions. You go off in all kinds of different directions. And then you try and come back home, as you know, if you have children or family around you. And um, maybe this process of exploration is, I don't know all the answers, but I have lots of thoughts about it. And I'm going to show you how maybe they all fit together. and come up with an answer which is appropriate for my teenage years, if you like. And then um, maybe I can explore this a bit later. And I think afterwards, he kept the teenage feeling in him and was always ready to explore and go a little bit in a different direction. And sometimes like teenagers too, Matteo, with the preludes, you get bored after a short period of time. So you go off and do something else. So you, you write one kind of prelude and then you have the, another kind, and so on. Yes? Indeed, indeed, yes. That's also true. I, I find, uh, yeah, the, the, there is this quality also to these preludes. Uh, you are completely right. And, and again, to, to recall the question of Maria also, why we play them more in a unity? Again, maybe because we find a unity in this almost schizophrenic, like <laughs> let's say it's a teenage feeling. So uh, some preludes really flow one into another in the following one. So there is a, we, we can find a longer tail, let's say an evolution uh, or a story, if you want, in uh, between the preludes. Uh, maybe not so much in other prelude cycle. Uh, this uh, would be interesting to discuss. Um, uh, the Scriabrin preludes, for sure, they, they came out from this um, model of Chopin. So maybe Scriabin was already more conscious about what he wanted exactly from these 24 preludes, uh, because he could already uh, take from the experience of uh, his uh, let's say ideal maestro, uh, Friedrich Chopin. Uh, then maybe Rachmaninoff, not so much. He imagined more these preludes, uh, again, to be substantial for themselves. Uh, you can also play them together, but it's, it's not uh, the same concept, maybe. I don't know. That's an interesting point. I, th I think also in the... Well, I think we have to really keep in mind that the Romantics were deliberately trying to make change. I mean, they they were, in the way that they write out what Romanticism is, it's, I mean, the label Baroque is not from the Baroque era. The, the Baroque label is the Romantics labeling the Baroque as Baroque. And um, the Romantics define themselves as Romantics to be separated from the, the classicists. So what they were really trying to talk about, I mean, the culmination, I guess, is Wagner with the Gesamtkunstwerk and then Scrabin with the mystery and um, uh, all the clave de lumière, all this kind of ideas with synesthesia, is the whole artwork, right? So if we take even someone like Mendelssohn, who's probably one of the more conservative romantics, uh, he, he's, a, he's a 
polyglot. <laughs> he, he, he's a philosopher, he's a, he's a novelist, he's a poet, he's a fine artist. He does everything, not just music. And this idea that you're just a musician is quite a 20th century, actually, uh, idea in many ways, because the romantics as such were very keen to put all the arts together. They, the, the idea of the romantic salon is very important in the 19th century. Much more happens in a romantic salon than it does in the concert hall. And it's not a derogative use of the word salon, which means sort of, sort of second rate music. That This is almost like statesmen uh, coming together and making very big waves that end up with political uh, meaning as well as cultural meaning. So the idea of putting stuff uh, uh, together um, and idea of preludes and etudes, uh, for me, I mean, you, you probably can tell I like painting quite a bit and sort of ballet. Uh, if, if you look at the ballets that were being put on, you could go and hear etudes. Um, and etudes in terms of ballet would have been to go see the exercises at the bar. You would go and watch people do their exercises. Um, it was seen as a, a type of art. Uh, similarly, this is the, the same time that you're getting art exhibitions, which aren't showing canvases uh, from floor to ceiling. You're getting exhibitions of people's notebooks. You're getting exhibitions of things like um, Constable and his clouds, uh, the sketches that nobody was meant to see, the stuff that was meant to be burned, the, the, the stuff that was private. It's the working out before it gets onto the canvas. Uh, the Delacroix painting with the Chopin, that's a study. That's not actually a, a painting as such. You can tell it's rough around the edges. It, it, it is a study. So the idea that people were putting out work in progress uh, starts to really take hold because people are starting to give value to somebody's thought and intent more than the finished product. And that is a huge change from 18th century practices where you don't show off unfinished things. You, you just, if you're not, if you haven't finished, well, in the case of Mozart and the Requiem, you go get someone else to finish it for you and pretend it's finished. But you certainly don't publish a half, half finished thing. Um, so, so culturally, there's a, not only tolerance, there's an interest in unfinished things and thinking about the potential of where something uh, might have gone. And, and so, I mean, I, I'm thinking straight away of, of actually <laughs> rather grim stuff, but Schubert's gravestone where it says, fairer hopes are buried. You know, not you've achieved this. I mean, thank you for what you've done. It's no, no, we've we've lost all this amazing stuff that could have been. Yeah. So we give in the 19th century far more value to to things that are just drafts. So preludes and etudes make sense culturally um, as as a genre. It's, it's this kind of museum collection, right? It doesn't have to be complete. It's the thought that it could have been something that that starts to have value that it didn't have before. Um, I think that's, that, that drives that change in, in the genre. That, that also drives the techniques as well. Um, you don't have to have finished your piece. And also maybe the interest of finishing other people's work. Um, the sense that, you know, I mean, if, if we look at the, the Russian Nationalist School, most of their stuff was unfinished until Rimsky Korsakov decides to finish it. Um, for, for better or for worse is a different debate, but it's, it's the sense that uh, there, there is that idea of, I'm not going to finish. Uh, in Brahms's case, of course, it becomes even more as a question, doesn't it? The first symphony that takes 21 years to finish is celebrated as a, wow, it took you that long. I mean, imagine telling Bach, you will write your passion in 21 years. No, it had to be for a Sunday. You, you, it wasn't thought of as something you could leave for that long and, and that it would be valued that you didn't manage to do it all in one go. So maybe we can say, um, seeking for to explore experience becomes more important than finding an answer which is complete work is you know, a form of an answer right that's it that's my answer and just having a prelude is creating a exploration of that unique experience which and so that tops the completed finished masterpieces of the past or a different kind of um, uh, composition. Um, well, you can see where it's heading in the 20th century, can't you? All this romanticism of experience is this going to become expressionism. So, I mean, it, it's all a continuum. I mean, they, they don't just wake up one day. Um, we, we decide in retrospect to say, right, we need to draw a line for the romantic somewhere. Somewhere in Chopin's life that happened around his time. Uh, the exact date, who knows? It could have, he could have felt more 
less romantic on a particular day. I think maybe that that actually really shows in his output quite a bit because, for example, take the Nocturnes as a, as a collection. Uh, there are very classical, almost John Field-like Nocturnes that are they're, they're popular, but they they are very symmetrical, ABA structure, nice chorale in the middle. Um, you don't have strange key changes and then others which are so difficult to even pin down harmonically where they're going and how long they're going to go on for they just have all these abrupt uh changes so you can see it, so it's this kind of volatile state within their lifetimes that they, they're they're leaning in and out of it and i think we we need to put um put people into neat boxes right because they fit nicely into historical categories so we go around sort of saying right chopin's romantic so we he can't have classical style in him and um we, we read things like the the list which is really putting on lots of romantic language but we sometimes forget that the reason list has to put on this romantic lang language because everybody else is still a bit behind right everybody else is still in that more classical mindset and needs a bit of prompting um we don't need prompting well i i'd say we're largely romantic still uh we we like a bit of feeling of I don't know the answer because it gives us a personal kind of safety um, that, that we still enjoy. Uh, but it, it does mean that we're more prone to sort of over romanticize uh, Chopin to see it as, oh, he sat down, it was spontaneous, he was an improviser, it just came to him. Um, as Matteo said, the prelude didn't just come to him, even though he was a wonderful improviser. They are so carefully constructed. He, he anguished over them, like Matteo said, and then with the editor, I need more time, I need more time. I mean, it was crab and it was kind of the opposite. I think they were written and he told his editor he needed more time because he just needed more money. Um, but but that, that sense that actually, you know, it, it, it is a struggle, but it, when you narrate about it, oh, they're a genius. It just comes to them. They just sit down, you know, nice mood. It's all there. Uh, they didn't think about it. They didn't sort of have to have to think through it. Um, that That's the, I think, the romantic, post-romantic mindset. This is us trying to make sense of them in that way. And that, that balance is always going to be shifting. Uh, Matteo, would you like to play one more prelude before we um, complete the session on romanticism? Why not? Why not? So, we'll, yes. All right. Well, for, just to uh, continue from where Maria left, um, Indeed, uh, in, we we still have in us this romantic feeling. Of course, we have to classify everything, uh, put uh, everything in chronological order, and uh, we, we like to do that as a species. But <laughs> usually, history doesn't work like that, and there are many gray zones uh, in between. So again, also Chopin, the very early compositions or the ones that we got published after he was already dead, uh, they were more in this Biedermeier uh, style. So again, uh, exploiting the new instruments, the new piano, showing off a bit. And he found later on his true voice or what he thought it was, it was the, his true voice for the moment. Then he developed again, as you said, in very, very, nicely is the, the process that makes then the, the evolution what what it could be more than what it is it's the, the part uh, the, which interests more in the romantic in the romantic period and yes of course after, uh, when we go into the 20th century after even we know scientifically that some things we, we cannot know them so it's impossible to know after Heisenberg, after all these uh, genius people, uh, how uh, physics exactly work or where is something in, in a certain moment. So after we even know scientifically that there are open questions in this world, then we can even more understand and appreciate what uh, in the 19th century artists, musicians, they imagined, they felt the, the, the ma mankind and also nature was full of unanswered questions. And uh, there was something beyond, of course, reason, calculus, and uh, you know, precision, order, and this kind of uh, older 
let's say, more ancient way of thinking. So, yeah, very interesting uh, point of view. I, I agree on totally. I'm on the same page. With <laughs> nice. So I will play maybe one more. And uh, thank you again, uh, Larisa, for hosting this debate and uh, giving us this uh, wonderful opportunity to exchange thoughts and ideas about Chopin and romantic music. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So with that, we're, uh, we're concluding today's session on Romanticism and Music. And we look forward to seeing you at next webinar. Veronica, please tell us about what's coming up. Okay. Well, right after this, if you guys would like to stay, we have a violin masterclass with and Professor Annie Shalik Boyle from Texas Tech University and there'll be three violin performances. And then on Wednesday, February 23rd, we will have Professor Denara Clinton um, on the piano and she'll be yeah, doing a piano masterclass with the students of Menuhin Music School from the United Kingdom. And on February 24th, which is a Thursday, from three to 4 p.m., we will have a piano masterclass with Dina K. Jones and yeah, and then on, on that same day, we will have right afterwards from 4 to 5 p.m. a, um, a panel, no, a um, discussion and a lecture and performance from Professor Stephen King, an oboist. And he will be bringing on a, um, one of his students as well. So those should be a lot of fun. And um, before we can conclude, I would just um, like to introduce those of you who might have missed the new dates for this summer's edition of the Orfeo Music Festival, an international classical music event, classical music event and a one-of-a-kind opportunity for ambitious classical music student performers to travel in Italy in July to train with world-class faculty performers, participate in their master classes perform internationally and gain recognition in concerts, go on trips and musical tours of historical locations and make new musical friendships and international network of professional connections. 
This year, Orfeo Festival will not only feature or feature the original festival program in Vigitano, Italy from July 4th to July 16th, but will also offer a special additional program, the musical tour of Russia from July 16th to July 26th. Students can apply to participate in either the Italian or Russian section programs or both. The event is suitable not only for student and educator performers, but also those with strong interest or professional involvement in the arts and music. You can register for the event through March 15th or by March 1st for the early bird registration rate. We would like to thank our sponsors as well. That includes the Orfeo Music Festival Foundation, Mayor Vipitano Peter Volger, Department of Culture, City Council, and Department of Tourism of Vipitano, Italy. If anyone here has any questions, we can encourage you to reach out to us directly or by visiting our website at www.orfeomusicfestival.com. We thank you all for attending today. It was truly wonderful and we look forward to speaking with you again or seeing you at the festival.